And welcome back to another episode of What the Forensics. My name is Nicole, and like always, I am joined here again by the lovely Journey and Rebecca. This week, Journey will be telling us all about feral children and the case of Jeannie, and Rebecca will be educating us on the conspiracy theories of feral people living in North American national parks. This episode's topics are a little different than our other episodes, but we hope you enjoy listening and learning with us. I would also like to note that there's a listener's discretion advised, as there are detailed descriptions of child child abuse, neglect, and abduction. My brain is also not currently working because it is uh, exam season, so I apologize in advance. Um, On that note, Journey, would you like to start us off with the case study of feral people and what they are? Yes. So I get to tell you guys about feral children which I didn't know a lot about before doing this research, so I got to learn a lot as well. And so the term feral child refers to a human child who has lived in isolation from human contact from a very young age. And as a result, they have little or no experience of human care, behavior, or human language. And feral children are often a result of horrible abuse and neglect. And then they either were abandoned or ran away. And I'm also going to talk about Jeannie, who is one of the most famous feral children who is raised in extreme isolation. And then I'm going to talk about feral children who were raised by animals. And then on that note, you guys will know a super famous feral child who is Mowgli from the Jungle Book. So he's not based on a real person. He's completely fictional. Um, But... Tarzan, who is also a feral child, is based on a real person. And so I talk a little bit about him towards the end, which is kind of cool. And um, a feral child can also be said to have Mowgli syndrome, but that's not a real diagnosis. And it's more of just like an unofficial term to refer to feral children like Mowgli. Um, So Jeannie is a child who was locked in her bedroom for the majority of her childhood. She was isolated and abused by her father for about a decade. On November 4th, 1970, a social worker found Jeannie, who was 13 years old, when her and her mother accidentally entered a welfare office. Her mother went in there looking for assistance for the blind because her mother was almost completely blind. Um, The social worker then learned that Jeannie had spent most of her life in her room, tied to a potty chair, often wearing a handmade straight jacket during the day, and then in a crib that was covered with like a chicken wire across the top, like a human cage. Um, Her father hated loud noises and did not want children. However, he and his wife ended up having lots of children, but most of their children died to neglect. Um, Jeannie spent her life in her room, often tied to something like I mentioned, and if she made any noises, her father would beat her with a baseball bat because of his intense dislike for noises, which is super unfair. Um, When the social worker finally intervened, Jeannie was severely underweight. She couldn't speak and had the physical abilities of a toddler. And I should also mention that Jeannie is not her real name. It's the name that was given to her case file to protect her identity and privacy. Um, So Susan Curtis, who was a linguist graduate student who was part of Jeannie's rehabilitation team, kind of explained their name choice in the documentary Secrets of a Wild Child. And so she says, uh, quote, the case name is Jeannie. This is not the person's real name. But when we think about what a genie is, a genie is a creature that comes out of a bottle or whatever, but emerges into human society past childhood. We assume that it really isn't a creature that had a human childhood, end quote. So that kind of ex- explains why they chose the name Jeannie. Um, Susan Curtis also befriended Jeannie and kind of attempted to teach her language and challenge her to find out what her mental capacities were. She learned that Jeannie was super intelligent and she was able to tell stories, but she used pictures instead of words. And then Curtis also worked with Jeannie to teach her English, and it kind of worked. Uh, She was able to learn and absorb most of the English language, but was still unable to produce a grammatically correct sentence. 
Um, I do have an example of what Jeannie said about what her father did to her to give you more of an idea. Um, quote, father hit arm, big wood, Jeannie cry, not spit, father. Hit face, spit, father hit big stick, father angry, father hit Jeannie big stick, father take piece wood, hit, cry, me cry, end quote. So she understood what was happening to her and she was able to like articulate a sentence to explain it even though it wasn't grammatically correct but it still gives you an idea of like where she was at um the national institute of mental health or nimh funded research into genie's case and genie was brought to ucla to continue her rehabilitation and to kind of study her uh, when she first arrived at UCLA, she was only 59 pounds. She spat a lot and was unable to straighten her arms and legs. And so she kind of walked like a bunny rabbit was how they described it. Um, she wasn't able to straighten her arms and legs because she had been in a seated position for such a long time with no chance to stretch her muscles. And so this can also happen to children who like walk on their tiptoes for too long. Their Achilles tendons and other muscles and tendons in their calves are unable to relax and lengthen, and so sometimes they'll have to get surgery so that they can walk with their heel down. Um, Jeannie was also unable to control her bowel and urinary movements when she arrived at UCLA. She didn't speak, and she couldn't chew her food. She only recognized her name and the word sorry. Uh, psychologist James Kent who was part of her rehabilitation team, kind of assessed her emotional and cognitive abilities and described her as, quote, the most profoundly damaged child I've ever seen. Jeannie's life is a wasteland, end quote. And so it was really difficult for him to like accurately assess her cognitive abilities because she couldn't speak. And so she scored around the level of a one-year-old when given certain tests. And when I was watching the documentary, it kind of examined or explored how close her and James Kent had gotten. Like he really took a liking to her and like um, really cared for her and wanted to like see if she could create a relationship with someone else because that's something that she was never given an opportunity to do uh, when she was growing up. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. Um, and during her rehabilitation period, Jeannie began to progress in certain areas, such as using the bathroom and dressing herself. And then over the next few months, she was able to make more developmental progress, but was still weak when it came to her language abilities. And even though she had such a traumatic upbringing, she still enjoyed going out on like day trips from the hospital and exploring her new environment. And I think it's actually really cool that even though she was so horribly abused, she was still curious and excited to learn and see the world which is not something that we see very often in people who have been abused. And even though she couldn't speak about what she saw, she was able to understand what people were telling her. In the documentary, um, Susan Curtis tells a story about when they went to a yarn store and Jeannie wanted a name for every color of yarn that was in there. And she would get so mad when Curtis would be like, that's, I guess, a very dark blue, or that one's very, very dark blue, because she wanted a better word for it. She's like, that's not good enough. I want a better word. So I think it's cool that even though she couldn't articulate, like, a sentence, she could still understand that she, there's a better word than very dark blue. Um, and then one of the other psychologists on her team, David Riggler, gave a really nice description of what drew the researchers to Jeannie. And he said... Quote, I think everybody who came in contact with her was attracted to her. She had a quality of somehow connecting with people, which developed more and more, but was present really from the start. And she had a way of reaching out without saying anything, but just somehow by the kind of look in her eyes and people wanted to do things for her, end quote. And so it kind of gives you a really good idea of her personality and how sweet she was. And then if you actually watch the documentary, you can really see that. Um, Jeannie also lived with Riggler for four years after she was taken out of her house, uh, where she, after, out of the house where she was living with her special education teacher due to concerns around her quality of care. But that happened after the special education teacher was like, no, you can't study her anymore. This isn't, this isn't good for her and kind of 
took away the access that the um, researchers had to her. So I find that a little bit questionable. And I think we learned about her in our classes because like we've heard her name and we've talked about her in classes and stuff before because she kind of sparked a debate around if children who were raised in isolation could develop language and then also the ethics around studying a child who was in this situation. And so her discovery really excited the psycholinguistic world because she was raised in such a harmful environment and it really called into question what the critical period is for children to learn a language and that if she had been placed in a nurturing environment, if she could have learned a language. And so the critical period for language development for children is during the first five years of life until puberty. And so it's thought that if a child isn't exposed to languages during this time, it will be very difficult or even impossible to develop language abilities. And so that's why um, scientists tell us that it's easier to learn a second language when we're younger than it is to learn it now after puberty. Um, another researcher by the name of Chomsky who was alive before Jeannie, like before 1970, before we discovered Jeannie, um, he suggested that we were born knowing how to speak and it was not something that we had to learn. So his belief is that it's completely in our nature to speak and it has nothing to do with nurture. However, a different scientist, Lenneberg, argued that we may be born knowing how to speak, but there's a deadline to when we can effectively learn how to speak. So it's his idea where the critical period hypothesis comes into play. Um, and so in regards to Jeannie, she was able to generate two word phrases like we saw in her description of her time with her father. And she did struggle with past tenses and auxiliary tenses like to be, to have, to do. And she had some difficulty understanding like grammatical constructions. Um, and so she could read some words and had quite a few descriptive words for things, even though they're not usually the right words and she was good at vocabulary and conveying messages but lacked the grammatical understanding to create a proper sentence. Um, they were able to teach her a little bit of sign language because she used a lot of gestures to communicate. I don't know how well it worked um, but there's a clip in the documentary um, and it kind of shows her repeating in sign language what an interpreter is saying to her which is kind of cool. Um, and so the scientific takeaway from this case was that Wernicke's area in the brain, which is the area for language comprehension, it absorbs various languages and meaningful signals in a unified way, whereas the Broca's area, or Broca area, where, um, which is in charge of our understanding of grammar, it stores first languages and second languages learned later in life in separate areas, which supports the evidence for the critical period hypothesis because Jeannie was able to learn English after puberty, but was unable to learn the grammar that goes along with it. And so because her language abilities were so stunted, the scientific community is kind of arguing over whether she's a good example of the importance of the critical period, or if there were mental deficits that um, kind of stopped her from being able to learn a language fully that she had prior to um, 1970 when they started researching her. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Wasn't, I don't know if it's her case specifically, but don't they use feral child children a lot in the sense of um, like the whole nature versus nurture debate on how like behavior and I'm thinking of it in like a criminogenic way, but like why people do things. I don't know if you came don't... across anything. Not really. They more, more of what I came across was how um, different we are from animals. Like, how can we as a human fully survive with animals? Mm. Okay. Rather than what you were talking about. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, because I, the only time I learned about feral children was in grade 10. So a couple years back. Um and it brought up the whole nature versus nurture debate because these feral children basically had no nurture. So the way yeah. they were raised was strictly nature in a sense. And then it it was a lot of, there was a lot of debate at the time with the nature nurture 
um, debate, whatever it was. So I didn't know if you had come across any of that. Yeah, nothing specifically, but like my understanding is that had Jeannie been raised in a nurturing environment, Mm -hmm. would she still be able to, I don't know, speak? Like they did kind of talk about it, but never to the extent that would answer your question fully. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, so, in 1974, four years after she was discovered, uh, the National Institute of Mental Health removed funding for her rehabilitation and study because there was a lack of scientific findings. Good. And so during, yeah, <laughs> this is where I get mad. Um, during these four years, Jeannie was mostly living with David Riggler, one of the psychologists on her rehab team. But after the funding was removed, she was given back to her birth mother. What? Um, yeah. So her mother was old and basically blind and super weak. And so, uh, and she had been acquitted of the child abuse charges. I'm not sure why. And she wanted to take care of her daughter again. Um, no. No. <laughs> how does that happen? How does she get given custody of her daughter after what just happened? Like, that does not make sense. You can't be charged for child abuse and it be, like, proven pretty much and then just get get the child back. Like, I don't understand. And she's like, no, I want to take care of her. Like, Jeannie's existence literally is proof of child, child abuse, abuse and neglect. Yeah. So why... Why would any... Mm, interesting okay Mm -hmm. and the mother didn't seek help when she knew that her daughter has been horribly abused it was they found her by accident she didn't like actively go and seek help for her uh so her mother then decided that looking after Jeannie was too hard so Jeannie was then placed into the foster system where her neglect and abuse continued and then her mother filed a lawsuit against the researchers for, quote, excessive and outrageous testing, end quote, and that they placed testing over the well-being of Jeannie. What? Yeah. She's going to try she's just and... extorting her child for money at this point. Yeah. Like, I feel like Which this was her much... idea all along when she was getting her child back. Yeah. Like, how... Okay. In my notes, I have this, like, in all caps because it (laughs) makes me so mad because her mother, like, played an active part in her abuse by not doing anything about it and then got her back and then gave her away to a foster home to be abused and neglected some more. So how does she have a right to file a lawsuit against the people who were trying to help her? Like, help Jeannie. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense to me. And she's, like, filing the lawsuit against them, extorting Jeannie for money. But I feel like her mother is using this opportunity to make money for herself. Like, and yeah, I don't understand. I never um, really understood why people, like, do you, does she not understand that what she did was wrong and that she's just okay with, using genie to exploit like exploiting genie for money apparently not apparently she has no issue with it something's but like definitely not right yeah so her mom Violet. is not yeah. she's very sick and like mentally ill um that's not me saying that that is actually like a fact <laughs> um <laughs> i just want to put that out there um yeah and this just kind of proves it so that, yeah, anyway, it just makes me really mad. So Jeannie was then returned to the children's hospital after her first foster placement, where she was punished so severely for throwing up that she had to go to the hospital. What? And who punishes a child for throwing up? Who? What? Oh, my God. Like, yeah. And so all of the progress that she had made in those last four years were gone. And she was afraid to speak again. There's a video of her, like, not opening her mouth, and the person who's talking to her, I think is Susan Curtis, and she's like, oh, were you hurt for throwing up, and now you're, like, keeping your mouth closed so it doesn't happen again? Like, is that what you're doing? 
And I was like, wow. it just, it's just maddening. Um, so now she's living in an adult foster care home somewhere in Southern California. Um, her exact location isn't known because no one knows who she is still. Which I think is pretty cool that they were able to keep her identity such a secret for so long. Um, and yeah, I definitely recommend watching the documentary Secrets of a Wild Child. Because it was really, she's such a sweet child and you get to see her like interacting and talking and playing um, in this video. And it's really cute. But it does use politically incorrect terms to describe feral children. Uh, so if that's Ooh. triggering to you, maybe avoid it. Um, so to kind of wrap up her story, uh, both of her parents were charged with abuse, but her mother was acquitted and her father committed suicide the day before he was supposed to appear in court. He left behind a note that said, the world will never understand. Um... I think we understand he was a piece of shit. I don't think there's much more to know. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, the world will never understand what happened, but I'd still kind of like to hear what you have to say about it. So is he saying it as if, like, the world will never understand his point of, like, his reason why? That was that was my takeaway. And that he was doing it for the better, like, for her good, and people just won't get it. Yeah, probably something like that. Oh, God. Yeah, so he's just fantastic. Um, okay, but Jeannie also had a brother um, who survived. And so I found an article that kind of, like, outlined what his life was like growing up in the same household. So I'm going to talk about him quickly. And this article is a wild ride. Because it starts out by describing how his grandmother was hit by a car and then dragged down the street when they went out for ice cream when he was six years old. And so that's just how it opens up the story. And so you're hooked immediately. Um, Jesus. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jeannie's brother's name is John Wiley. I don't know if that's his real name or not. I think Wiley is their last name. Um, and he is the oldest surviving sibling. Uh, the article also says that one of his other older siblings was killed at two months old because she was crying, and so her father wrapped her in a receiving blanket and left her in a dresser drawer in the garage. So it kind of adds to the picture of their father. Um, and so John had been living with his grandmother when she was hit by a car, and so after she died, he was forced to move back in with his parents. And he describes his house as a concentration camp, quote unquote. Um, he was beaten regularly and was forced to keep watch at the door to help hide what was going on in the house. So Jeez. obviously his parents knew what they were doing was wrong. Oh, yeah. Um, his father also blamed John for the grandmother's death because he was with her when it happened. Um... And apparently they had two rooms in their house. One of the rooms was Jeannie's and the other room was decorated as a shrine to the father's mother, like the grandmother. And as a result, the rest of the family slept in the living room. His father slept Oh, that's on a messed up. Yeah. The father slept on like a reclining chair. His mother slept at a chair at the dining table. And then John just kind of like slept on the floor. Oh. Um... I'm getting I'm real, just a little like, speechless right now. Yeah. yeah. I just placed what memory was like triggered in my mind, but I'm getting real glass castle vibes. Oh <gasps> yes. Like this whole yes. story just reminds me of that to like an extreme. Um, like very yeah. Yeah. Um, so when John reached puberty. His father punished him by tying his legs to a chair and hitting his testicles with the board slash bat that he used to hit Jeannie when she made noise. What? Yeah. So that's messed right up. And John thinks, oh, I can't remember what he said in the article, but it was like, I don't think he wanted me to have children. And I'm lucky that I was able to have children, even though I like survived this trauma. Yeah. Um, and so even though 
Like, Jeannie was given a bunch of treatment once they were rescued. He was never given any treatment um, to kind of remedy the trauma. Um, the investigator even, like, acknowledges this by saying, quote, John was as much a victim of the family dynamics as the younger sister was, but he was so little a part of the direction of the case, unfortunately, we never really paid attention to him, end quote. And so... I don't really know how people can just completely write off his experience and ignore him. Yeah. Um, he was 18 when Jeannie was finally, like, rescued, and he had run away, but okay. still. Yeah, it's... Like, they knew he was part of the family. They had contact with him. I guess they could have came at it at a point of view where, oh, he's already developed... We aren't going to have as much progress or understanding than what we can get from Jeannie. Yes, probably, but I still feel like some Morally, kind of it, therapy yeah. of like, hey, let's maybe talk through what you went through as well. Mm, yeah, that, that, that could have been helpful. Because puberty was a rough time for you, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah, um... So, John was also outside the house when his father committed suicide before the trial and heard the gunshot. Um, yeah, and when he, like, went in, I don't know if he found the body or whatever. I'm assuming that there was, like, police outside the house because they must have had him in custody or whatever. Um, but his father left another note other than the one that said, the world will never understand. This one said, be a good boy, I love you, and had $400 for John. So, oh. like, ugh. That's... And then, when I reread that, do you think that was the first time that his father ever said I love you to John? Probably. That's probably the first time they ever did anything for John. Like, why give him $400? Right? You didn't love him. You're gonna physically abuse him once he hits puberty that to that extent and extreme and yet before you take your own life because you know how much of a piece of shit you are pardon my french you're still gonna pull the i love you here's money do great stuff yeah like does it just like, like does your mentality just change once you become a parent like, I couldn't imagine being a parent and just not taking care of a child, but still being like, meh, yeah, I love you. Like, does it just come right? with being a parent? I have no idea. <laughs> what? Like, and how, like, if you were John, wouldn't that mess you up so much? Like, this man who beat me quite intensely loves me? What does that mean? Like... I can't yeah, even that's, imagine. That's going to skew a lot of things for him. Yeah. And so, not surprisingly, as he got older, he had quite a few run-ins with the law. Um, he did get married and live in a small Ohio town and have children. Um, his marriage ended after 17 years, and he now lives on his own and works as a house painter. He lost his license because he got, like, a DUI and is still not settled. But his story is, like, super sad. Um, and then I was going to talk about the girl in Austria who was, like, kept in a basement by her father. You keep talking about her, Nicole, like, when we're texting about this one. Mm -hmm. Um, it's way worse than this. So I, um, I'll save this for a different episode where we're not already so sad about what happened to this child. Yeah, because honestly, all I can remember, I didn't even know if it was a female or male child i just know in grade 10 for my sociology class we learned about feral people and we watched a short documentary and this individual was like chained and jailed in this basement and was never allowed out never could see sunlight ever since they were born essentially so when she she or he was freed um they had no socializations like nothing and it was just very extreme yes um that sounds actually a lot like Jeannie's story 
So you okay. probably watched Secrets of a Wild Child. Probably. Um, but no, this girl was locked in a basement by her dad and just it just gets worse. Um, yeah, gross. So yeah, we'll we'll put that in a different <laughs> episode because I mentally could not handle researching that after looking at Jeannie. No, that um, makes sense. So I'm gonna talk about children who were raised by animals. Um I kinda I'm gonna talk about six children who were each raised in the wild by a different animal. Uh, Marina Chapman, who was raised by monkeys, Dina Sanachar, who was raised by wolves, Oksana Malaya, who was raised by dogs, Daniel, who was raised by goats, Hadera, who was raised by ostriches, what? and the real-life Tarzan. Okay, I'm excited. I've only heard about a wolf one, so I'm excited. Yeah, and these ones, like, are not, the, the last couple ones, there's not a lot of research and stuff on, um, and then the first couple are, like, actually famous. Um, so, uh, Marina Chapman lived with capuchin monkeys in the Colombian jungle from the ages of five to nine after she was kidnapped and then let go in 1954. Um, after she was rescued from the monkeys, she was then sold to a brothel, had to live on the street, and then became a slave for a mafia family. Uh, however, a neighbor did rescue her from the situation and hired her as a nanny and moved her to England with them. But guess how old she was when she was finally rescued from the Mafia family? I feel like 12 or something super young. Yeah, she was 14. Oh, and she was in with the monkeys until she was 9? Yeah, so between 9 and 14, she like worked at a brothel and lived on the street and like was a slave. That's horrible. Like That's it. awful. Yeah. Um, but luckily, like, the neighbor rescuing her allowed her to get married and have children, and she was able to live a fairly normal life, which is unusual for most feral children. Um, she also wrote an autobiography called The Girl With No Name in 2013, if you want to learn more about her story. But it did take a while for the book to become published because none of the publishers thought it was a real story. They were like, no, that's fake. I can see that. Is, yeah. Um, and so, like, a couple of professors have tested her to see if her memories were real. And one says they're true and the other one says they're false memories. So no one really knows. Um, a second i have is dina sanachar and i'm sure you guys have heard of him he's very famous um he was discovered living with wolves in india by a group of hunters in 1872 uh he was around six years old when he was found and taken to a local orphanage when he first arrived at the orphanage he supposedly walked on all fours and ate only raw meat and he lived among people for like the next 20 years but he never learned how to speak and was seriously mentally impaired. Um, he did start smoking. That was one of the human traits he picked up on. What? And, yeah, I was like, why? Okay, whatever. Um, and he made noises that were similar to a wolf. So he could probably communicate with like his wolf family, which is kind of cool. Um, but he died of tuberculosis in 1895. And he is known as the real life Mowgli. And some people think that he was the inspiration for... Rudyard Kipling, who wrote The Jungle Book. I apologize if I said his name wrong. I've never said it out loud before. Um, and I'm going to post a picture of Dina Sanitar on our website because I guarantee that a lot of you will actually recognize him. I recognize his photo. I have no idea from where, but I've definitely seen it before. And then we have Oksana Malaya, and she is a young girl from the Ukraine who lived with Black Russian Terriers for six years. Those are dogs, if you don't know. I Aren't know. those tiny, yappy dogs? Aren't Terriers small dogs? That's what I have in my mind. What what? But I type did, of dog again? I Something Terrier? Them. Black? Black Russian Terriers. Russian. Not the cocktail. Terrier. Oh, no, they're, like, um, they're a breed of dog from, created in the USSR, military working dogs. Oh, they sound scary. Oh, they're, like, kind they're of very fancy. cute. They have I'll curly fur. Yeah. Black Russian Terrier. 
They look oh. like yeah, they're not oh, the so small they're yappy not... orms. Oh, they can they get to be massive. huge. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Interesting. Okay. Anyone watching, look up Black Russian Terrier. So you can, yeah. if you don't know what they are. Wow. Okay, so okay. basically raised by wolves. <laughs> huge <Yeah>. dog. <laughs> There. Wow. Okay. Um, anyway, she was found in 1991 in a kennel with the dogs at the age of seven and a half. She couldn't talk and lacked quite a few basic skills. And so when she was three, she crawled into the barn or wherever the dogs were and snuggled with them because she was neglected by her alcoholic parents and was looking for comfort. Um, and so when she was rescued, her behavior imitated dogs more than humans because she walked on all fours, bared her teeth, barked and didn't know any other words other than yes and no um as she got older she was able to learn how to kind of like tone down her dog-like behaviors and she learned how to speak fluently and intelligently uh she's still fairly seriously intellectually impaired um but she's able to work at a farm milking cows in the ukraine um and she went on a talk show and she said that her story wasn't that dramatic and that she was left outside and went to the dogs for warmth. And when she learned that they were more responsive than her parents, she kind of began to imitate and interact with them. So. It's interesting that it happened with domesticated animals. Like They I were not domesticated. Of... Where they lived, there was like a whole bunch of just like wild dogs. Oh, so they weren't even like the family dogs. No, like some of them were pets. And then some of them are wild, so there's just, like, a whole bunch of dogs kind of in a back alley kind of thing. Oh, I see. Because when I see this yeah. kind of dog, I'm like, yeah, it's, like, someone's pet. Like, you breed to have one of these dogs. But, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, from my understanding, there was kind of a mix of between, like, domesticated and feral dogs. Um. So next we have Daniel. So he was known as the Andes Goat Boy, and he lived in the wild for about eight years. Um, he was raised by goats in the mountains in Peru. He walked on all fours with the goat, drank goat milk, and ate berries and roots. Uh, he was found in 1990 when he was 12. Um, there's not a lot of information on him, even though he was studied by a Kansas university. Um... But at the time they found him, he couldn't speak a human language, but he was able to communicate with his goat family, which fascinates me. Do you think they, like, cognitively understood each other, though? Probably. Like, if how does that you, work? If you didn't know anything else, and all you had been taught was how a goat lives... I feel like you could do it. It's obviously they can because quite a few of these people could communicate with the animals they were raised with. Do you like, ever wish to like, been, like hit a restart button and just like start over and be like, hey, you know what? Let's let's just talk to animals this time around. Yeah, I'd be a cat. I want to learn how to speak to cats. Yeah, my cats would probably say a couple rude things to me, so I'd <laughs> avoid that one. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. I think it'd be interesting. Um, okay, so second last, we have Hedera. He's my personal favorite. So he is known as the ostrich boy. And so he his he was lost by his parents in the Sahara Desert when he was two, and he was then adopted by ostriches. <laughs> also, if I pronounce ostrich wrong... I've said it so much in the last two days, I've forgotten how to actually say it. <laughs> I hate um, when that happens. <laughs> I know, I was telling this story to a friend last night, and I was like, I, I don't know this word. Anyway, when he was 12, he was rescued and taken back to society and his parents. Um, he was able to get married and have children, and one of his children told his story to an author, and she wrote a book about it. Um... So this one I had to do a little bit of extra research on because I was explaining it to a friend and it sounded so fake. I didn't believe what I was telling him, <laughs> but <laughs> it is true. And the author was traveling through the Sahara Desert when she first learned about him. He's kind of like a local, not myth, but like 
story that everyone talks about. So, like, a lot of the locals from the community she was visiting would tell her about the ostrich boy and then would perform an ostrich dance that Hedera had taught the locals when he was reunited with his parents. And that's kind of what they have for proof that it was a real story. Because she was like, oh my goodness, this is a real story. And they're like, yeah, haven't you seen the ostrich dance? Like, he taught this to us when he was finally found. And I was like, ah. Uh, That's so some- wild. My God. Yeah. That so- reminds me, kind of related, unrelated. There's a species of bird that's like super extinct and they're in captive, whatever. And I guess she, the female bird killed the male bird, couldn't mate with them. So the caretaker like took on the role of the male bird and he learned like all of the mating dances and the bird like things and so he would do go through these bird mating rituals and then she'd get super turned on by it and then they'd artificially inseminate her (laughs) like she had a huge crush on this guy (laughs) so unrelated but related (laughs) okay i have a point to go on with that that gets a little bit ethically questionable (laughs) um with daniel who lived with goats Um, I read an article and he's like, where did he go? Where is he now? Did he get released to go live back with the goats? And if so, could he breed a goat? Would it be bestiality or would it be normal? Like normal in quotations, because that's the society that he grew up with. To him, he wasn't having sex with an animal. It would be similar. It would just be a part of his species at that point he wouldn't know any yeah. different like i'm sure they couldn't like have a goat human baby <laughs> because of genetics and like that just wouldn't work we're not compatible <laughs> but like yeah is is that bestiality or is it not if he was living with humans for a little bit before going back i'd say that's bestiality <laughs> Yeah, it's not a question that I liked, but I thought it was very interesting, <laughs> so I wanted to share. Um, okay, so back to Hedera. Uh, the last thing that I have on him was that one of the author's sources went as far as to say that Hedera was the favorite son of the ostrich couple that he lived with. I have no idea how they know that, so that's probably not true. Um, and the last story that I have for you guys today is about the real-life Tarzan. He, his name is William Charles Midland. He was shipwrecked on the coast of Africa from 1868 to 1883, and he spent those 15 years living in the jungle before he was able to return to England. Um, he was the 14th Earl of Streatham, and when he passed away, a bunch of documents were found that kind of told his stories of his life in the jungle. And so, supposedly, he stumbled onto a colony of apes during his first day in the jungle, and they weren't scared of him, but were instead curious, and went up to him and kind of checked him out. Um, And I found a quote from his journal describing this encounter, and it says, For some strange reason, I was not afraid of these strange creatures. They were hideous to look upon, but nevertheless seemed gentle and harmless. End quote. And after their initial meeting, the apes offered him nuts and grubs and roots to eat, um, which is kind of weird because that's not usually how apes would interact, to my knowledge, but I find it very interesting that they were just so curious about him and were like, hey, what's up? Who are you? Join our family. Here's some berries. Okay, yeah, that's all I have. Um, Feral children have kind of, have existed for like a super long time. Another famous example is a guy named Victor who was found in 1800. Um, I didn't really talk about his story, but they talk about it in the documentary Secrets of a Wild Child. Um, Yeah, most of the stories of the feral children that I could find were raised by dogs and primates, which is kind of interesting. I don't know why that is. I wonder if they have, like, more of an instinct to take on youth of whatever species like maybe they just see children as children yeah i have no idea 
but it's very cool. Yeah, and it was kind of cool to kind of see, like, how our human body adapted to, like, different environments and circumstances and how Mm -hmm. the people were, the children were, like, able to survive. And I'm going to leave you guys with a philosophical question Mm -hmm. that they kind of popped on me in The Secrets of a Wild Child. So, like, feral children and feral people kind of sparked a debate over what it is that makes us human. Is it our appearance? Is it that we can walk upright? How we communicate our society? Because that's what we think makes us stand out. But you can find a parallel of each of these things in animal communities. So, like, what really separates us from an animal? And so... A lot of, like, scientists have kind of pondered this question, especially after they, like, found feral children who can communicate and live with animals. And even though they're, like, human in form, they are animals by behavior. So, what makes us human? We talked about this in my sociology class, and the main thing that came up, but then my my teacher was like, but animals have it too, was our intellectual capacity capability and cognitive behaviors but if you think about it animals are just as cognitively aware and capable as we are just in a different context and probably more so Mm -hmm. like i would argue that there's a lot of dogs that are a hundred times smarter than me oh yeah (laughs) but like and like that's the same with anthropology we talked a lot about like what makes us a homo sapiens versus a homo, like a Neanderthal. Mm -hmm. And literally, they're like grasping at straws with like the brain capacity. Because that's one thing that changed. Yeah. We had a debate in, um, well, it was more so a discussion. It was an interesting discussion um, in wildlife forensics where our prof was like, are species a concept or like, are they a real thing? Like, did humans create species? And how would you differentiate them? Yeah. So I feel like the same could be said for animals and humans. Like, sure, they're different species, but... But, like, what's a species? We made up a species. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, so I'll just let all you listeners think about that. Let us know what uh, you guys think. Yeah, let us know what you come up with. Yeah, I'm curious to hear all the different sides of it all. Yeah, because a lot of people were like, oh, religion makes us human. Not every human has a religion. And who's to say animals don't have religion? We don't speak animal. Good point. So, I don't know. That's some stuff for you guys to chew on. Well, I don't and didn't need that philo- <laughs> philosophy at what seven p.m. on a Wednesday. <laughs> You're but welcome. That's okay. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> on that note, um, we're gonna switch gears and bring it back to Rebecca to kind of link some conspiracies we've been hearing about on social media to uh, these feral individuals. So, if you want to take it away, Rebecca. <laughs> I would love to. Um, So just as a little bit of a forenote, uh, because of the nature of this topic, like it being a conspiracy, there aren't really many reliable sources of information. Um, It's more so just like blogs and videos and stuff like that of like people explaining their own views on the theory. Um, So with that being said, I'll try to provide uh, the best objective explanation of what it is. Um, and then some of the evidence that people have for it and its prevalence in the media, and then we'll let you guys decide what you think of this theory. So, um, what exactly is the conspiracy, sorry, conspiracy theory on national parks? Um, the gist of it is that there are feral people, so as Journey was just describing, but are also referred to in this theory as wild people. Uh, living in various national parks around the world, um, although all predominantly talking about the parks in the United States, just because that's kind of where most of this theory is perpetuated. Um, It's believed by many that a lot of the unsolved missing persons cases uh, of people that have disappeared in national parks um, have actually been kidnapped and or killed by feral people who live in the respective parks. Um, So... 
I'll get into this a little more later, but feral people in this context uh, would likely be a bit different than what Journey had just explained and how it's people who have been experiencing years of abuse and neglect during their childhood. Um, It seems these conspiracies are more so about just people that don't live in society, but it's not because of neglect or anything like that. They just aren't part of society. (laughs) Um, so I just sorry for- to interrupt. I have a question. Yeah. Um, just to before we get started, do you know, mm-hmm. like, were you able to find a rough estimate on like sizing of national parks? Because for me, it's hard to like conceptualize people just living in national parks going unnoticed, um, and becoming feral in that sense. So, like, it's crazy to th- I'm also we're not in the states so i don't I'm, like have a national park to go off of because me out here i'm like oh like going to kedgy like someone camping in kedgy kind of thing it's a bit different than <laughs> feral. yeah so uh just for like a little bit of context there's national parks of like all sizes um okay. One of the largest ones, actually, I think it is the largest one in the United States. I don't talk about it in terms of feral people, but this Mm -hmm. is uh, just from the National Park Service website. Um, The largest national park is the Denali National Park and Preserve, and it's 19,186 square kilometers. So they can get pretty big. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. I will keep that in mind. (laughs) No problem. Sorry to interrupt. (laughs) No problem. Um, So just while we're clarifying uh, exactly what national parks are, uh, for those who might not be terribly familiar, they are a natural and like mainly untouched geographic area that's protected by the government for preservation and conservation purposes of the wildlife there. Um, Although that they're owned by the government to ensure that urban development or other destructive activity doesn't take place, they're generally still open to the public through various hiking trails and camping sites that are preserved by the government as well, so that they can allow uh, people to enjoy the beauty of the natural world. In Canada, the governing agency is Parks Canada, and in the United States, it's the National Park Service, uh, which I will be referring to throughout the episode as NPS, just because it's shorter. So um, I didn't know where to start with this theory. So I wanted to kind of go back to its origins. Um, So kind of the first case that people believed uh, wild people might be involved in a disappearance was that of the disappearance of Dennis Martin at around 4.30 p.m. on June 14th of the year 1969. So Dennis was just shy of his seventh birthday when he, with his nine-year-old brother, as well as his father and grandfather, went on a camping trip along the Appalachian Trail in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Uh, And just for some context, this borders, um, sorry, this straddles the border of North Carolina and Tennessee. So part of the park is on both sides of the states. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, So... The camping trip took place over Father's Day weekend, and it was a family tradition for them to go camping every Father's Day, so this was unlike no other. Um, However, as Dennis was still pretty young, you know, he was still six years old, this was actually his first time going camping outside of the city with his family. Um, So they'd already spent a night in... uh, in kind of a field in the Appalachian Trail, but they wanted to spend another night and they knew where another campsite was. So they headed to their next destination, which was called Spence Field. This was still along the Appalachian Trail. Here, they met up with another family who they knew who also had children and they were going to spend the day together, you know, just kind of having a good time on their camping trip. Um, This family had, um, I'm not sure if they had multiple sons or just one son but either way uh they did have a boy kind of around dennis's age uh so they were friends him as well as his brother and they wanted to try and like play a prank on their families like they kind of wanted to jump out of the bushes and scare them um because they were just kids the parents already kind of knew what they were up to but they wanted to play along to pretend to be scared to kind of satisfy their kids 
Um, so Dennis's father, Bill Martin, actually saw his son walk into a bush to hide. Um, but he didn't say anything because he knew what, what was going on. So after five minutes or so, all of the other kids had already come back out and had already scared all the adults. Um, but Dennis hadn't come back yet. So his father became pretty concerned and obviously he went over to the bush that he saw him walk into, but he didn't find Dennis or anything belonging to him. So in a panic, thinking maybe his son got turned around on the trail, um, Bill actually ended up running two miles down the trail, yelling and searching for his son immediately after realizing he's disappeared. Um, but after about two miles, he stopped running when he thought about how unlikely it was that his son got that far in just five minutes. So when he returned to the campground, the two families began searching the field and the areas surrounding it. Um, but after a few hours of just them searching, uh, they really expected to find Dennis, but they hadn't. So they ended up contacting the NPS Rangers. Um, just for con some context of the Great Smoky Mountain National Park, it can be pretty dangerous if someone strays off the trail, uh, just because it has really dense forests as well as ravines and steep slopes. Uh, the rock, the, sorry, smoky, what did I just call it? The, the Great Smoky Rocky Mountain? <laughs> that National Park. Anyways, that mountain that they were on was actually, it's known as the tallest mountain in the the Appalachian mountain range. Uh, so it, it did have a lot of kind of cliffs and steep areas. In addition, it was home to various potentially dangerous animals, uh, including bobcats, black bears, feral hogs, and also uh, two species of venomous snakes. Um, so in addition to the already hazardous terrain, especially to a six-year-old, only a couple hours after notifying the rangers of his disappearance, a massive storm hit and ended up causing three inches of rain in just a few hours, as well as some very heavy winds. Um, so that same night, temperatures also dropped to just around 10 to 15 degrees Celsius. So it was going to be very cold for Dennis, who went missing in nothing more than a t-shirt, sorry, t-shirt, shorts, and Oxford shoes. So due to the storm, uh, they weren't able to go looking for him right when it was reported missing. So search efforts began at about 5 a.m. in the next morning. However, it actually still took them a few hours just to get to that area of the park that he went missing because the uh, massive storm had caused the rivers to flood. Uh, it led to various pools of stagnant water, which can be very dangerous to human health because of all the diseases it carries. Um, and also, many of the Rosen trails were completely washed out by mud and debris and water from the flooding. So despite the storm, the search effort became the largest in the history of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. By the, by the afternoon of the same day the search commenced, there was already over 240 volunteers, and this included rangers, local rescue uh, squad members, as well as Boy Scout troops. Uh, all showed up to the Spence field to look for the boy. The investigators uh, looked at the investigation in hindsight at the amount of inexperienced volunteers who came out early in the search process, and they really regret the mass effort, uh, not because they don't think the child should have been found, but because they believe that a lot of the evidence that could have been left behind was very likely accidentally destroyed by the inexperienced volunteers that simply didn't know what to look for. So over the course of the two-week search, uh, over 1,400 people were involved in searching for him and any clues of his whereabouts. Um, searchers included not only volunteers, but also guards, or sorry, troops from the National Guard, uh, Green Berets, search dogs, and also helicopters. Um, although the helicopters weren't much use because they said the forest was far too dense to see anything through. So after the search, which covered about 150 square kilometers, all they had actually found were footprints, which they believed to be Dennis's because they were about his foot size and one of them was barefoot, but the other one had a shoe print pattern. So it seems like um, someone was walking around with one shoe, which volunteers wouldn't be doing. Um, and the shoe print they had found was similar 
to the style of shoe that Dennis was wearing. So this led to some speculation about where he had gone. Um, also, just a small distance from the foot tracks they had found, they also found a single sock and shoe. However, this was the only physical evidence that they ever did find. Um, today in 2021, no one knows what happened to Dennis still. Um, and his missing persons case is actually still open and it's listed on the U S national parks cold case website, which, uh, I have linked cause it's an interesting site to go through. And if you have any hints about any of them, then they encourage you to contact them. Um, there's various theories as to what happened to Dennis. And this includes the pretty common ones like falling down uh, one of the steep ravines, uh, succumbing to the elements if he got turned around, um, or even just being attacked by an animal when he wasn't expecting it. Um, but the theory his father believes is that his son was abducted by someone or something. This theory was supported somewhat uh, by a witness account of a family that was camping at a site that was around five miles from the Martins at the time. Um, and they claimed at some point during the same day that Dennis was reported missing, they heard, quote, a trouble scream, an enormous, sickening scream. We couldn't tell which direction it came from, but it sounded like it came from higher on the mountain to me, unquote. And then just a couple minutes later, they reported seeing a very disheveled, dirty looking man uh, hiding in the bushes across the creek. And it was clear that he was trying not to be noticed. Um, the family who reported the scream said he looked like he was a moonshiner which i believe is just someone that chooses to leave society to go live in nature um despite the promise that this lead held um you know someone heard a scream nearby the campsite it didn't actually provide enough information to lead to any conclusions about his whereabouts um and so it didn't really lead them any closer to finding him However, many people do still believe that these campers may have been the last to hear from Dennis and that this man that they saw could have been responsible, but we will very likely never know. Um, so that was the first case that people began to speculate a feral person was living in the national park and harming people. And it was partially because of the disheveled man sighting that these people had seen close to the occurrence. Um, and although this was the first high-profile case of a mysterious disappearance in national parks, many have disappeared without a trace in them since. Surprisingly, like very surprisingly, this kind of shocked me, when search and rescue attempts are made in national parks, the NPS is not required to maintain a record of the missing person cases or events that happen. Um, and even if they locate remains of missing people in the park, they're not required to keep the records of it. Um, why? I have no idea. That feels and like something that you'd want to keep a record of. Right? I agree. Like, I, I couldn't find an explanation for why this is the case. But I'm just a little in shock by that fact. <laughs> Do they, like, I'm assuming that they would have to report if they found a body in the woods. So then like the police would have that on record? That I don't know. However, they aren't legally required to report when someone goes missing in the park. I don't know if like it's the family's job to report them missing or what, but yeah, I, I read that if the National Park Service finds that a person has gone missing in their park, they're not legally required to report it to authorities. That seems super questionable. I agree. <laughs> wow, that, that's actually really scary. Yeah, um, and so because the National Park Service doesn't keep record of how many people go missing in them every year, it's up to civilians and researchers to kind of figure out and maintain data sets of missing people in national parks. Um, so David Politis, he was a former police officer and now private investigator, um, he's the creator of a book series and now docu-series on Amazon Prime called Missing 411. Um, and it estimates that around 1,400 people have gone missing without cause on national public lands. So these are people that it's almost like they just disappeared, like they vanished in thin air. That's um, so scary. Yeah, I agree. Um, Yikes. 
One of the key components of the theory that feral people are living in the national parks and abducting people is that, at least to an extent, the federal government is in on it, and they're fully aware that there's feral people living there. Um, So the theory goes that the true reason the federal government has designated certain geographical areas as national parks is not actually for conservation and hiking alongside beautiful views, but it's actually to monitor the feral populations that live within the areas to protect the public. Um, And that they have created these designated hiking trails because they're fully aware that if this wasn't government operated land, people would still be trying to go in and find hiking trails on their own. So to reduce the chances of them running into a feral population that the police or that the government knows about, they've created trails that kind of go around the geographical areas that these people live in. Um, When you combine that with the fact that they can't report people missing, it makes sense. Right? Like, I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist, but... There's some sketchy stuff going on with the facts here. (laughs) Wow. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, So when theorizing why the government hasn't told the public about these people, as well as why national parks aren't required to report missing persons, um, one of the beliefs that why they haven't disclosed it is because they know people will be too afraid to return to the parks if they knew about the civilizations. Um, But these national parks are big revenue for the government. So they want to make sure people keep coming to enjoy the views and paying the government to go camping and go hiking and just, you know, enjoy nature. And so they're trying to hide the public, according to the theory, from uh, the truth that is feral people are living in the national parks and sometimes hunting people. (laughs) Honestly, free rent. Where do I sign up? You can live in nature. You're like kind of monitored and you just can live rent free in a national park. That kind of sounds like a prime time. Not going to lie. Aside from the whole kidnapping and possibly killing people, um, the rest sounds great. You know what? I gotta agree with you. Just rent one of those old, like, Volkswagen... Not rent, sorry. You gotta buy one. Buy one of those old Volkswagen bus things and just go... Let's go live in Yosemite. Why not? Well, like, even... How much was it, Jubes, when we went through? It was 40 bucks a day to just go through was, Banff? It's, I think it's, like, 10 bucks a day or is it 10 per person? Anyways, it's expensive. Yeah, it was 10 per person. So yeah, it was 40 bucks because we were there for two days. Yeah. And, and they could, just made could... another one for Kananaskis where it's $15. Really? Mm-hmm. See, we we could be avoiding all of that. We can just live in them. Just not pay them. that. Yeah. <laughs> They'd never Honestly, know. Honestly, I'm down for it. They'd never know. Um... Yeah, but besides the whole government is hiding it from us thing, um, if there are really feral people living in their own little civilization within these parks, who are they? It's already known that some people choose at some point in their adult life to become hermits in the woods and they live off the land and avoid civilization and they do this successfully um, and it works for them personally. Um, but I don't think they're quite the main focal point of this theory. Um, one belief that a lot of people have, but others find it very, um, unbelievable. So they don't think it could be true or some are just offended by this belief. Um, but I'm just sharing it objectively. Um, A lot of people believe that the supposed feral people that are living within national parks are actually indigenous civilizations who managed to evade colonizers when they were colonizing North America, and they've just continued to live untouched by the modern outside world in these ancient civilizations, Uh, just like the island uh, that's completely untouched. I think it's in the Amazon or... 
Asia somewhere. I don't know, but there is a an island with an entire untouched civilization that will try to harm you if you enter the island. Um, so yeah, that is one belief. Uh, a lot of people say that it's probably not true because if this was the case, then we definitely would have found some evidence of these civilizations living there. Like we might have found their their housing. Their we might have found like remnants of weapons that they use or hunting. You know, there's a lot of reasons that this very well could be just a theory and isn't real. Um, but it's definitely something to consider, considering there are still untouched civilizations in the world today. If it is true, that is the coolest thing in the entire world. <laughs> My so, inner anthropologist is just going crazy with the idea of that. <laughs> that would be pretty cool. How could they stay so, like, untouched by other civilizations, though? I feel like they just someone would have found them and yeah i feel like the somehow. practicality of it is yeah not like yeah see that's where i get lost on it too is the practicality that no one has found any evidence of them um some people that are really into the theory suggest that um they know like some of the entrances that might not be as familiar to like underground cave systems and that they mainly get around the parks through these cave systems and that's why people we don't see them going from one location to the other um but it's all a lot of speculation so yeah Interesting. so with that being said it's hard to say just how much truth is in this theory um everybody kind of has their own opinion about it um, and there might be multiple explanations for uh, many of the disappearances that have occurred that have gone unexplained, with the simplest of them just being that the missing people lost their way while they were in the parks, because it's very easy to get lost in the woods, um, and eventually died by exposure to the elements, or were attacked by an animal, or fell into a river, canyon, cliff, some deadly uh, place by accident. So there are also various accounts of people who have supposedly come across feral people or encountered them in the national parks, as well as accounts of people who have disappeared but later been found in the parks that suggest that something human was responsible for the disappearance, um, but they don't remember a lot of the event. However, at this time, feral people living in national parks is um, only just a theory with a lot of interesting and intriguing stories surrounding it. This theory got really big for some reason on TikTok in like 2019, and it's kind of stuck around since then. Um, so there is a lot of cool stories and theories and stuff like that on the app if you wanted to get sucked into a rabbit hole to learn more about it. Um, however, also super interesting and relevant to it is the book series and show that I mentioned earlier, uh, Missing 411 by David Politis. We're not sponsored by him. I just <laughs> think it's a super cool series. <laughs> um, he basically just discusses a lot of, like, every chapter basically is a different missing persons case of someone who has died under completely unexplainable circumstances. Um, and a lot of them do take place in national parks. Um, so, yeah, this is all I really have to say on the theory. It's really easy to get sucked into a rabbit hole of research when you're looking at this. So if you're interested in it, I encourage you to um, find your own rabbit hole on this topic and teach us more about it, what you learn. Um, I guess we have a lot of le questions for the listeners today, because I had a couple too. Uh, um, uh, I just wanted to know, like, what do you think of this theory? Do you believe that feral people are responsible for disappearances in national parks? Um, do you think the government is trying to hide something or that this theory is just completely fake and off the wall? Um, the yeah. government is always trying to hide something, <laughs> whether it be feral <laughs> people or not. <laughs> always trying to hide something. 
Um, and the very last thing I wanted to say was that um, I found a pretty cool interactive map while I was researching. Of It's a map of missing people in the U.S. And you can sort it based on like missing females, missing men, um, John Doe and Jane Doe's whose bodies have been found but don't have... Um, sorry, don't have an identity yet. Um, and it's completely volunteer run because the US government doesn't really have a database like this. And so it's really just using um, resources such as Name Us, uh, which is N-A-M-U-S. It's a website uh, for missing people in America that families can submit like their missing loved ones to in hopes of finding hints and stuff. Um, so yeah, that interactive map will be linked um, in our sources. And also the cold case website from National Park Services, because it does have, I think, like 26 uh, brief descriptions of cold cases of missing persons in the parks, if you're interested in checking those out. Um, included in that list is the open case of Dennis Martin, as they've never closed it. So, yeah, that's all I have to say on the theory of feral people in the national parks. Well, thank you. I was really excited going into this because... I only had my grade 10 one course lecture day on it. Um, so I was interested to see kind of your takes on uh, both of that. And like you kind of mentioned, TikTok, that's kind of how we got the idea for this episode. So thank you, social media. Um, but anywho, next episode, I'm actually really super excited about this. We're going to be talking about Jonestown Massacre and toxicology. Um, I genuinely don't know a lot about Jonestown. Like, I know the premise of the Kool-Aid and all of that, but that's basically all I know. So I'm very excited to do some research. Um, I hope you guys are interested and excited, too. Um, anyways, I have somewhat of a joke for you. It's like a joke, but it's not very funny, but it's a joke. <laughs> okay. Um, so, <laughs> I don't want to say it now. What if it's, what if you guys don't laugh? Um, okay. I will laugh at anything <laughs> that is an attempt at a joke. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, someone asked me the other day if I was one of those conspiracy theorists. My response was, why? Who are you working for? <laughs> that, that, that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, valid. <laughs> okay on that note um we again want to thank all of you guys it's been so crazy the past couple of weeks when we've had our little off time um with school and work and everything we hit over four thousand total downloads which is just mind-blowing to us um, it's we hit so exciting right like like that's such a big number I can't what? fathom that many people that we don't know listening. listening to our podcast. And I just think that's super cool. Right? It's so cool. And we and have over that... 100 downloads on all of our episodes, too. Yeah. That's so just cool. a, a lot of people listening to our mm -hmm. voices. That kind of, you know? Anyways. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we also hit... um what was it, two, three days ago, we had 500 followers on Facebook. That's huge. Um, That's impressive. So we just want to thank all of you guys for sticking with us. We know there's been some inconsistency with school and work, but we really appreciate you guys constantly having our backs and listening and spending time with us and learning things as we learn things. Um, but if you want to find us some more, like I said, we've got Facebook. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram at What the Forensics. Our Twitter is WTForensicsPC. And most of our information actually is on our website where you can find all of our social medias, all of our sources, pictures, a um, little bit about us, and some merch. Not going to lie. We've got some cool stuff. And that's WhatTheForensics.ca. And you can get a hold of us at whattheforensics at gmail.com. So this has been another episode with yours truly, the three of us. We hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you next time.
Just a reminder to everyone that we are not professionals in the forensic science field. We are just students who are learning and want to share what we are learning with our listeners. We're trying to give you the most accurate information, but we are human and we can make mistakes. Thank you so much for listening, and we hope to see you next week. Thank you.